Famous geneticist J.B.S. Haldane once said that if God had created all living organisms on Earth, he must have an inordinate fondness for beetles. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. So today we are discussing the order Coleoptera, or the beetles. And as always, if you don't know what an order is, you can click here to check out my video on scientific classification. It took me a second for me to remember which side I needed to point to. Part of the reason is because I haven't been able to record too much lately because I just finished defending my master's thesis. So I officially have my master's in entomology. So hopefully I'll have more time now to focus on making some videos for y'all. Anyway, let's get back to beetles. So the order Coleoptera, or the beetles, is incredibly diverse. I mean, there are over 400,000 described species. That's 40% of described insects and a fifth of all described animals on Earth. Oh, sorry, I, I actually misspoke. It's actually a fifth of all plant and animal species. So beetles are a fifth of all plant and animal species combined that we've successfully described. I mean, just look at some of the diversity of beetles we have here. And this is just species that have been officially described in scientific literature. Every year we describe more and more species. So this order is not to be taken lightly. Despite their incredible variety, there are luckily some easy ways to tell you're looking at a beetle. The obvious one is the presence of elytra. So nearly all insects have two pairs of wings. And in Coleoptera, the forewings have evolved into what we call elytra, which are hardened and stiff, and they fold over the back of the insect, protecting the hindwings. And that's what gives them their sleek, glossy appearance. So this structure is unique to beetles, which is why it's such a great way to identify them from other orders. And this is actually what gives the order Coleoptera its name. Coleos means sheath, and terra means wing. So Coleoptera means sheath wing. But be careful though. Elytra, just like beetles, can come in a variety of shapes and sizes. In the fireflies, for example, the elytra are less stiff and more leathery. And in rove beetles and soldier beetles, the elytra are reduced, where they won't fully cover the hindwings. So keep an eye out for the different forms that elytra can come in. Beetles also have chewing mouth parts, both in their larval stage and their adult stage. So does the phrase larval stage sound familiar? Well, if you watched my Lepidoptera episode, you'll know that butterflies and moths are holometabolous. So they have a four stage metamorphosis from egg to larvae to pupae to adult. And maybe not as talked about as butterflies and moths, but beetles are also holometabolous. They go from egg to larvae, and then they pupate into their adult form. And like butterflies and moths, they also play very important roles in our ecosystems. As expected from their massive diversity, they fill a wide variety of niches in their environments. For one, beetles are critically important decomposers, cleaning up a bunch of things that we perceive as refuse, such as dung, carcasses, and rotting wood. Take the dung beetles, for example. Coprophagus, or dung-eating beetles, are believed to save the United States cattle industry $380 million annually. That's just from cleaning up cow dung. Other beetles are necrophagus, feeding on dead carrion, which helps clean up roadkill and other decaying animal matter. When human bodies are found, these guys can also be used to help estimate time of death. This can aid in criminal investigations and is its own field called forensic entomology, but that deserves its own video. Other decomposing beetles feed on decaying plant matter, such as leaf litter or rotting wood, and this greatly aids in nutrient cycling in our ecosystems. Beetles can also be carnivorous, with predaceous beetles like ground beetles and lady beetles providing important pest control in our agricultural lands. Not to mention that some beetles can even pollinate. Other beetles are not as warmly welcomed by humans. And as with everything else, conflicts between man and beetle can also occur. Remember all those beetle niches I mentioned before? 
Well, one I have not mentioned yet is the herbivorous beetles. Over half of all beetles are believed to be dependent on either living or dead plant tissue. And as expected, some of these can be large pests of human agriculture. Perhaps one of the most impactful being this guy. Leptinotarsa disemlineata, or the Colorado potato beetle. In some regions, this beetle can cause 40 to 80% crop loss in potato, eggplant, pepper, and more if it goes untreated. Many of you may also be familiar with Japanese beetles, a type of scarab that's a pest of turf grass, fruit and vegetable crops, and ornamentals. In addition to agricultural damage, some beetles can cause huge ecologic damage when they're introduced into a region in which they're not native. Emerald ash borer is a beautiful wood-boring beetle, but since its introduction from Asia in 2002, it's killed tens of millions of ash trees in the United States and Canada. Okay, before we rip on the beetles too hard, it's important to note that nearly all major ecologic pests and many agricultural pests result from the introduction of a species into an area in which it's not native. So one of the big reasons why emerald ash borer and these other wood boring beetles can cause so much damage to these trees is because these tree species have not had time to evolve natural defenses against the beetle onslaught. And besides, as mentioned before, beetles are crucial to our ecosystem function, and they need our help so they can continue to provide their ecosystem services. As mentioned with Lepidoptera, the planting of native plants is a great way to increase insect diversity and conservation on your land. And this isn't just helpful to the herbivorous beetles, it also helps with the predaceous ones by providing them with productive hunting grounds. Another great strategy is the conservation of leaf litter and woody debris on your property. Instead of gathering up all your leaves and branches and logs as garbage, try spreading them around your plantings as ground cover, or even having a designated area on your property where you can throw some of that plant refuse. The beetles will appreciate it and it will help keep the nutrients on your land to recycle it back into the ecosystem. Also, large pieces of rotting wood can give rise to some really cool species. I mean, take this Eastern Hercules beetle, for example. So remember, the Coleopterans are the beetles, and they can be recognized by their elytra, as well as their chewing mouth parts in their larval and adult stages. They are also holometabolous, so they have a complete four-stage metamorphosis. Beetles are very critical to our ecosystems, as they provide services through decomposition of dung, decaying animal matter, and decaying plant matter, as well as predation of insect pests. They can come into conflict with humans in agriculture, and invasive species can be very ecologically damaging, but most beetles, nearly all beetles, are to be protected and conserved. And you can do this through the planting of native plants on your property, and conservation of plant refuse, such as branches, logs, and leaf litter on your property. As always, thank you all for listening, and I'll see you again soon. Peace.